I'm sat here today with my colleague, Dr. Roy Jackson, um, and we're hoping today to talk a bit about religious language. Um, but the most kind of central question uh, that comes at first, what is religious language as opposed yeah. to just like language? Yeah, so I suppose that, that gets to the nub of it, of like religious language in some way being different than other kinds yeah. of language. Um, I suppose, it, I think it was Bertrand Russell said that, that language is often seen as transparent in, in the sense that we see through it, you don't even think about it, it's just, just there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we could just be having a conversation about the weather and so We're just passing information and there's no kind of yeah. additional things going on. Not really, or, or what, and you're not aware of them anyway, yeah. so you, we're about having a conversation, but in actual fact, if you look a bit, a bit deeper at language, there are rules there. And yeah, there are things going on below the kind of obvious surface. Indeed, indeed. I mean, you have different forms of language, I mean, religious language, but you have, for example, political language, or you have um, respect language. You mm. know, especially for some cultures, this is quite quite important. Often you can listen to a conversation and you can tell from the conversation whether a younger person speaks to an older person, etc. So there are various rules and ways of speaking. And so I suppose religious language is the idea that there, there are certain rules within that or various claims that are being made mm. that might differ it from other kinds of language. So in terms of religious language having a claim to be a distinct category of languages, what kind of features might it have that stand it apart from those other sorts of languages, like respect language, yes. like um, informal language? You know, there's yeah. different things we find that we can recognise language groups. Sure. How is religious language marked out? Well, I suppose, for example, if I was to just say to you, it's, it's a nice sunny day today, and that's sort of fine, you know, mm -hmm. but, but if I would say, it's a nice sunny day today, oh God, it must be smiling upon me, yeah. <laughs> as an example. There seems to be, I seem to have gone from one set of claims to another set of claims that, that may, may not fit together. If, if we were talking the Middle Ages, maybe maybe it would have been part of a common mm. language, but, but, and in certain situations today it might be. But there seems to be a different set of uh, claims or a reference to different things going on there. So one would be ordinary everyday language, but the second half of that sentence seems to be referring to something that, that doesn't quite fit into the everyday, perhaps. So it makes it makes, albeit in that case, perhaps a little implicitly, um, an assertion of some kind of metaphysical existence and or care to you or yes, that yes, sort. That's right. Yes. So the introduction yeah. of metaphysical entities by stealth, as it were, mm. into mm. conversations might form part of religious language as a thing. Is there anything else that we can identify as religious use of language? Um, well, I suppose it's. I mean. It might be worth considering um, why, especially in the 20th century, this has mm. become such an issue. And I think it was a concern yeah. amongst philosophers. I mean, we think of the Vienna Circle in the 1920s. Well, that kind of obsession with language and kind of yes. linguistic turn in philosophy in that century right. means they suddenly pay a lot of attention. And the increased suspicion, cynicism towards religious faith means it's kind of almost you know, inevitable that religious use of language will come very strongly under the spotlight. Indeed. I mean, I think it was A.J. Eyre who said that we... His concern with philosophy, though, it seemed to be spending too much time, uh, time on time-consuming gibberish, I think he called it. And he was specifically, I think, making reference No, he didn't mess around, perhaps. No, so. exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, he was very, very careful with his language. Uh, but he's, he's focusing particularly on religious language, saying, well, when people say things like God is good, etc., uh, they're making claims about things. Um, but what is that based upon? Yeah. So that seems to distinguish it from me saying it's sunny today. Well, well, if I say it's sunny today, there are various tests you can do, empirical tests. Yeah, so if our friend came in, you said it's sunny today, our friend came in covered in rain yes. and wet, um, I'd say, I thought you said it was sunny. Yeah. You know, yeah. There'd be something that could, contra a set of state of affairs could come to pass mm -hmm. by which I suspect that you weren't telling the truth or your statement was false. Indeed, indeed, yes. Whereas what distinguishes religious language here is that they don't seem to fit those same kind of. Um, tests in, the, in this. So they're not open to kind of, to use those the terminology, empirical verification. That's right, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's responses to that, obviously, but... Uh, yeah, no, uh, but, you know, a century or so of them. Yes, indeed, indeed, them, indeed, really, yes. Yeah, yeah. So religious language is the kind of classifying it as making claims which are of either a different order in terms of not being empirically verifiable. I suppose one of the key defences about that is we when we use religious language, or should we use religious language, we don't mean the same things. We don't, and when I say God is good, am I asserting an empirical status 
which um, needs verifying or can't be verified or whatever, or am I asserting something else? Am I using language differently? Yes, yes. I mean, that, that defence against a kind of logical positive way says, well, that works for one use of language, but actually that mischaracterises or overly simplifies how people use language. Yeah. And actually, I might, mean, I might mean something metaphorical. Yes. I might mean something indeed. else. So is that rather a kind of overly harsh and perhaps naive way of thinking about the, how the human species expresses itself. Yeah, I think that, in a sense, that sums up often the problems with empiricism. It, yes. is, it, it, it has its limitations, and, and um, it often doesn't take account of, of the individual mm. or the communal meaning of something. Mm. Uh, there's that extra extra meaning, whether it's whether it's analogy, whether it's metaphor, or, or existential in some kind of way, mm. as well, which, which it doesn't really take account of. So there's that. I suppose we sometimes, when people talk about religious language, people introduce an idea that isn't that strong there in the original press to an extent, but it's derived from the work of Wittgenstein, yeah. where they want to talk about language games, and he uses the idea of language games, and other people, people like D.Z. Phillips, take it and very much, I want to export that as a concept that somehow makes religious language more comprehensible to us, mm. or makes more sense of it. So how does the idea of language games somehow extracted from the work of Wittgenstein. How does that apply to religious use of language? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's often difficult to know what Wittgenstein <laughs> meant by these things. They probably, yeah, not, absolutely. They probably theories as such, but more with just his point of view. But mm. um, but I suppose I, I, this is the idea that, that, that again, it, I thought we said about rules, really. Mm. Every language has rules. If you learn a foreign language, you become aware of that. And Wittgenstein is a sense applying that to, to, to religious language. It has its own set of rules and regulations in the same way cricket is different from football, etc., and things like that. And I suppose the consequences of that are that, that someone who plays cricket can't say that the rules of football are wrong because they're not following the cricket rules. You know? So right, religious yeah. language is the same. But they have their own rules. They have their own, own understanding of the terms they use and their whole rituals. Mm. That, if we talk about meaning they would say makes sense to them. The fact that it might not make sense to anyone outside of that community. So if someone was a non-Christian, say you were non-Christian, and you kind of said something very kind of critical about the meaning of the Trinity. Yeah. You know, say three can't be one, I don't understand what this means, how can, how can someone be their own father? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, all those kind of things. And they would, with that, say, no, part of the Christian language game is that the God is, is tripartite and has yes. these features, and that makes sense within it. It doesn't make sense to someone who doesn't get the whole system with all its rules. No, I try to like, taking a piece of bread and tasting it and saying, that doesn't taste like Christ to me. <laughs> you know, it's like you kind of miss the yeah, point. Yeah, example. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No. Um, so yes, it's like, it, it, it's, it's, miss, it's missing the point in a sense. It's missing, missing all the, the metaphor, the symbolism, and the history and the ritual attached to it. That but that's kind of... A philosopher's way of trying to understand something. Yeah. Now, many of the people who might be practitioners of those faiths may not be comfortable because that seems that it relegates their claims somewhat. Yes. What might have seemed a universalist metaphysical faith sure. about the divinity of a form of God of the whole universe mm -hmm. gets reduced to a, a custom of practice or community of language use. So, Wittgenstein's idea might appeal to us in, in terms of it helps us understand language use. But it may actually not match with how people who use that language in that community feel they're using it and the status they've been accorded to it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, to what extent does that become relativist or, or mm. somewhat subjective yeah. in this way? But then what do we then do? Do we then go back to empiricism or do we look at some kind of other method of testing things that most people yeah. might agree with and there isn't one in this sense? <laughs> okay. So that, but that gives us an insight into it. So I guess religious language in its in the most basic sense we think of as talk, God talk. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. But also it has distinctive features like there are things where in some religions they can't be said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, words that are prescribed, names of God, um, things that religions won't say. Yes, yes, indeed. Which yes. is a feature of demonstrating a certain kind of sacredness and belief and things, but it's a, it's a matter of using a rule. Yes. To, to come hammer home a, a rule about custom, a rule, rule about what you do, mm -hmm. to drive home what might otherwise be seen as rather an abstract point, when you can't say something becomes very noticeable. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you have, I mean, Buddhism, you have skillful means, don't you? you do, yeah. A similar kind of idea of, of, of you've got to communicate <coughs> in some kind of way. Mm. Um, and again, to what extent are we missing the points if we take things too, too literally? Uh, so the importance in religious language of 
things like skillful means or things like poetry, literature, art, etc., yeah. uh, as forms of, of trying to say something about God, when in actual fact, you can't. <laughs> yeah, well, many religions say that, and you find yeah. that even in uh, Buddhist language, not so much about God, but about the state of Nirvana and things. Yeah. When people say, well, we can't say anything about it, so we'll spend most of the time talking about it. Yes. That be? <laughs> and it's when we say, well, what it isn't, mm. but then everything else has to become a halting analogy, a kind of, you know, a kind of metaphor that limps towards articulating an aspect of yes, yes. that, but of course, often we find that people don't take them literally, we find the illustrations, mm-hmm. and then they disagree with the other metaphors. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, and you get conflict and yeah. discord and all yeah. those other things. <laughs> I guess the other flip side of the prescription, the the prohibition, is the requirement. So you know, you find in some Islamic traditions that if you mention the name of the Prophet, mm-hmm. you've got to sort of add an epithet. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and that's, that's, right. that's the relatively, and again, just hammering these things, I guess, into communities of use mm. really makes makes what could be problematically difficult features or things you could forget home. It really drives them. Yes, 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 yeah, that, that's mm. right. But again, there's always, I mean, it, it demonstrates the complications of language, I think, mm. when, when often what sim, seemingly simple expressions are so loaded. Right. Uh, I mean, one expression is something like Heavenly Father. You know, mm. which is obviously yeah. used a lot. Um, and there's people that I think is Ramsey in his original book, original title book, Religious Language. Um, yeah. You argued that, but it's a loaded term in terms of it, it's it's a father, of course, is, is a metaphor. Already, for, for, yeah. Yes, yeah. But also heavenly, it, it, it raises again this, this whole sort of existential response to it. Mm. Um, so you're dealing with it at very sort of different levels. You talked about object language and high language. It's like this kind of language yeah. that is very individual to you. Well, that's a very sense. good phrase, Heavenly Father. For most of it, it runs together some sense of something more powerful and Father yes. um, above us, something existential or metaphysical, with what we might feel about the idea of Father mm. and all the worldly associations. So it runs together that very easily in a phrase that we don't even think about normally. Indeed, indeed. But it's also meant to gradually sort of, I think you used the term disclosure, to gradually disclose more about what that means, so the idea of heaven, etc. So it the reveals, idea that it reveals more reflection on those terms actually comes indeed. to have. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing, the last thing I was really thinking is that those religious prohibitions and requirements that I was talking about, mm. what they also do very strongly is they bring about the possibility of transgression. Yes, yes, you yes, know. Yeah. So the more you bound language with rules and what is appropriate, the more you allow room for transgressive behaviour because there are religions that also use transgression as a very, um, and I don't just mean kind of minority religions in relation to kind of Satanism and things, but you find it very, in a lot of tantric traditions, the idea of transgressing boundaries demonstrate that they're not they're only for the ordinary people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite important. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, the origins of so many religions is a result of transgressing from something that was previous to it. I've be, seen be, seem to become too rule bound yes. and kind of worldly, and that actually the truth was much higher yes, and yes. could be bound by rules. Yes, which is often, I think, why mysticism is seen in suspiciously because mysticism claims to get back to the roots of religion, but it often does that by transgressing the rules that yeah. have been established over time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think we've kind of established that there are interesting things to say about religious language, even if we haven't said every last one of them today. <laughs> uh, thank you.